Have you seen the news about food insecurity, about food shortages? And yet we can do a lot about that. We can grow food in our own backyard, even if that's a sunny window. Hey, Provident Preppers, I'm Jonathan. And I'm Kylene. And I'm excited about today's class because we are going to talk all about how to grow food in your own backyard, even if that backyard is just a sunny window. No. And we originally taught this class to um, at a community education environment where we were able to do one-on-one -on -one in the class, and we wish that we could do that with you. But there is so much that we have learned because we've done this on our own. So today we're gonna share with you some of our tips that we have learned from gardening for years outside because you can grow an amazing amount of food in a very small space if you just know the basics. Today we are going to talk about how to grow delicious food in your own backyard. And this is so much easier than you might think. There are some basic principles that are really important and then you get to work. And through trial and error, you just get better and better. And the food that you can produce is seriously amazing. So today we're going to talk about basic principles and some ideas that you might want to consider so that you can grow food in your own backyard or inside of your house in a sunny window. Now, the most important thing, hands down, is the soil health, because the soil health will determine your plant health. The healthy soil is always high in organic matter and in biological life. Now, this is a super fantastic book. It's the Living Soil Handbook by Jesse Frost. And in this book, he goes through all kinds of approaches to making sure that you have healthy living soil because it's the soil feeds us the little microbes and those wonderful little living creatures in the soil that actually feed your plants and make everything so much more nutritious. So this is a really good um, reference. I will leave a little link for it. But some of the basic things that you need to know are about healthy soil is high in organic matter and biological life. And if you can just keep putting in lots of great organic matter, the life will take care of itself unless you put stuff in your soil that destroys that life. So stay away from those chemicals. We want to return fertility to the soil whenever possible. Um, anything that is organic can really be put back in there. Eggshells are highly valuable. Now for me, I like to crush them and I actually have something called a Lomi. It's a little composter that I put my eggshells in and some of my other things that are a little bit harder to break down. But you can also just put this directly into your compost pile or crush them and sprinkle them over your garden. The, the important thing is to get them back into the soil. Another thing that we might not realize that we could put back into our soil are paper products and cardboard. These are ideal for composting. So if you have a compost pile, which we'll talk about in a minute, there's all different ways to do this, but you need a certain percentage of greens and browns. And this helps with all the browns that you need. It's very, very valuable. So those toilet paper rolls and all kinds of cardboard and paper products are great for putting in your compost pile. Now, another thing is that leaves, all those leaves in the fall that people are putting out in front of their houses to get hauled off to the landfill, those are gold. So we have some of our friends save their leaves when they rake them and put them in the black garbage bags. And then what we do is we have these rows of carrots and beets. And then we just put those garbage bags on top of our root crops over the winter. You can see there is a lot of snow out here. The temperatures are freezing. But underneath that garbage bag, the carrots and the beets can totally be pulled out of the ground. And it's kind of fun to watch the difference because in the rows, the garden or the soil is frozen in those pathways. But underneath those black bags, the soil is rich and it's got lots of worms and beautiful life in it. In fact, we have a video about composting leaves and making high fertility compost out of it by Tom Bertels. You are going to want to check that one out because that's no work for you, free resource, and some really healthy compost for your soil. We have living composters. Both our rabbits and our chickens are fantastic at taking 
some of the leftover stuff that we have and turning it into highly valuable compost or manure for the soil. Our rabbits eat all kinds of leftover garden greens. In this picture, they're actually eating um, goji berry leaves. Some of the new um, little stems that grow from the goji berries, that's their favorite. It's also a favorite of the chickens. And goji berries grow like crazy and we're always trying to keep them under control. But any extra garden produce that I have, they love. When I prune the apple trees, I cut little sticks because they love to eat the bark off the prunings and it's really good for their teeth and makes them really happy and it produces all this wonderful manure for me. Now chickens will eat just about anything. So we have a lot of stuff that we put in with our chickens and they just eat it and turn it into compost or some of it like the orange peels, they won't eat, but they're scratching around and it just turns it into compost in the soil and it's amazing. There right now they're eating some um, comfrey. Comfrey is great for your compost because it deep mines those minerals from um, underneath the ground and brings them to the surface where some of the other plants have better access to them. Worms are also, a pop, they create this powerful compost. A small amount of worm castings can do significantly wonderful things to your soil. The one on the left here is a um, freezer that I got this idea from Tom Bartels too. Um, that it's just a freezer that doesn't work that we've put outside. We put air vents in it and um, we have it for a worm bin that we have to do very little work with. The other one is an inside worm bin that you have to take care of a little bit better, but it works really well too. Now, nature does this all by herself. We can make this easy or we can make it hard. But in this compost pile, um, there are billions of microscopic organisms and nature is just breaking it all down and creating this wonderfully fertile, rich soil for me to add back to our gardens. You can create beautiful compost bins. These are um, gorgeous separate bins that allow for really good airflow. So um, you're filling up one on the end and then the next one, the next one, the next one. Theoretically, by the time you reach the end, the compost on the first is going to be ready to put into your garden. These are compost tumblers. And um, a lot of people really like these. Um, I'm not a fan because I don't spend enough time. You need to put the stuff in, you need to put water in there and you need to spin it, which should be really easy. But I'm more a fan of when I just let nature do the work. But I know a lot of people who really like these for their garden. Now, the other thing is mulch. So mulch or lasagna kind of gardening. If you put that on the top surface, it slowly breaks down and it feeds the soil. And when you do that year after year after year, you just, you don't have to compost because you're building that soil by using nature and letting nature do that for you. One of the things that I do a lot is called the chop and drop method. And that's just where you're cutting things and you're, you're leaving that organic matter right where it was. So on the left, you can see that um, these are peas springtime is was pretty much spent when I did this in the peas it was their life was just about over but I needed to grow like my um, cucumbers and my tomatoes and things like that so what I did here is I just cut those down and I chopped them up I left the roots in place to decompose right there in the soil they cover the soil which helps to regulate the temperature in the soil and as they decompose they feed the soil on the right, you'll see that it's springtime and I have these little strawberries coming up, but I had way more garlic come up than what I had wanted. I just pulled out some of that garlic and I just laid it down there. And I'm just using that as a top mulch that will compost. And so there's all kinds of great ways that you can do this. And the choice is pretty much up to you. But closing that loop is what's important. Don't let that wonderful fertility be hauled off someplace else when you're cutting your grass or... um the leaves from your trees or any of the kitchen scraps, any of the waste that you have, it's not really waste. Keep it on your property so that you can maintain that fertility. Now let's talk just a little bit about indoor garden soil health. Now this is different. Indoor gardening, it's a lot harder to maintain that soil health because nature isn't there working for you. And so you have to kind of be careful. Sometimes in indoor garden, you have more of an issue with um, insects and those little gnats and all kinds of different things. But if you start with a really good, healthy, organic potting soil, it can make a lot of difference. And what I usually do is I'll grow the plants and then I will take the soil and put it out of my compost bin and we you know, mix it up 
with the other compost and it's just used back out in the garden where nature will take care of all of that. A little tip. So at the end of gardening season, I will go out and see who's clearancing their garden um, or the compost and I will stock up on it then for the next year because I can get it for less than half of the original price if I do that. And it's the prepper way, right? That way we always have a little bit ahead so that the next year we're not scrambling around trying to find some when there's supply shortage issues. Now, when it comes to indoor gardening, remember anybody can do this. Like if you have a sunny window, you can grow in a sunny window. If you don't, you can use some lights. These are inexpensive lights. We have a video that will show you what you need to look for in in lights. They don't have to be professional grow lights, but greens are super easy to grow, whether it's in a window or underneath these lights, they grow really fast. We use what we call the cut and come again method where you're just cutting off the outside leaves, as you can see in the bowl on the right, and you use those for a salad or whatever you're gonna use them in or a smoothie. And then a few days later, you come back and you do it again. And it gives us the longest amount of harvest possible before the lettuce bolts and it goes to seed. Now, what we've done recently is grown green beans just in a sunny window with no artificial light and they are producing like crazy now the beans when you plant them we usually do a variety that will um, mature in about 50 days so within two months from seed to harvest we've got beans growing and then they'll produce for maybe two weeks three weeks and then they're pretty much spent but those plants are fabulous for your compost bin because Um, beans are nitrogen fixers. Those are awesome. Make sure that you take advantage of those. But if you want a continuous crop of these, you're just going to replant a little bit sooner than every month. And then you can have a continuous supply. And all it takes is a sunny window. So an apartment or a very small home, any place that has a sunny window is going to work. Now, these peppers, these are amazing. They're so good. I did a whole video on this where at the end of the season, before the first frost, I dig up some of my pepper plants and I just butcher them. Like I take them back to their original like sticks and then I bring them in in a pot. And within a couple months, I have these beautiful peppers growing inside my house. I've got some under grow lights and some in a window. They produce really, really well. And then what'll happen is about um, when it's time to put them back out in the spring, when the danger of frost has passed, then I will give them another good trimming. I'll cut off all of the fruit and and take them back to that little stump and I'll plant them outside in the garden. And within six weeks, I'm harvesting peppers again. It is the coolest thing ever. I've got videos on that too. So just, you're going to want to look at those. I'll leave some links for you. Winter sowing. Say you don't have a place to start your vegetables early. This is really awesome, especially with cold weather crops, because what you can do is you can just use this milk cartons, right? You cut them in half, you put drainage holes in them. You can use any transparent container. It doesn't have to be a milk carton or a pop bottle or a juice bottle. Um, It can be anything. So we've got holes in the bottom. We put soil in it, put the seeds in it and cover them. And then we um, just tape that top back on. Now we want the very top of it to be open. I know it seems like little plants are going to freeze, but they have a higher risk of cooking than they do freezing. So we leave the tops open that allows the plants to breathe and to regulate the temperature. And then you just leave them there unless you go through a dry spell and then you might have to water them. But other than that, you just leave them there until the seeds are all sprouted. And then you can take them and go plant them out in your garden. It's a really cool, inexpensive way. And we've got some videos on that too. Another way to extend the growing season is to start your seedlings indoors, which takes more effort. You need the lights or a really good sunny window. Sometimes a sunny window, they'll have to stretch just a little bit too far and they'll be a little bit leggy. But under grow lights, it works really well. I do, I'll have to go and make sure that I'm watering them and checking for the bugs and all that where when I do the winter zone, I just kind of ignore it. And then these little miracle plants appear. Now, one thing that's super important, whether you're bringing plants home from a nursery or whether you've um, started them indoors under grow lights, you're going to need to harden them off. Winter sown plants don't need to be hardened off because they've already been outside. When you harden off a plant, it just means that you put it outside in like a shady area so that, and protected from a lot of wind, you want that plant to be able to toughen up against the real elements because it's never had to endure the regular sun. If you take one of those little nursery plants and put it right out into the sun, into the garden, a lot of times, 
that plant's going to have a really hard time and it might not even make it. So just by putting it in a sheltered location where it gets sun only part of the day will help to make it tough enough that it'll endure and it'll survive in your garden. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about our gardens. So um, I use what's called the no-till method. This is the no-till organic farm by Daniel Mays. And this is a fabulous book. I would highly recommend it. He's got great ideas in there. But originally, we had a regular till garden. And I kept reading and researching. I was doing research on permaculture. I took a permaculture design class. And the more that I studied, the more I realized that the old fashioned till method of growing a garden isn't actually the easiest. It's not the most sustainable. I decided we needed to try the no till. So what we did is we took our garden bed and we Till it one final time. And then we dug trenches, all of the pathways. We dug these little like 18 inch trenches for the pathway and we filled them with wood chips. And so we have these rows and then we have these wood chips. Now, every year when I go to plant, I would just double dig, which means I'd go down the row with a shovel and I turn it over once and then I go back the other way and I turn it over again. And then I just rake it smooth. That was all that, that was done to that. You can see over here on the left, the pathways are working really great and we've got great fertility. And then in the center, you can see it when it's it's full and it produces really, really well. So this one that you're looking at is just a backyard garden design where they've got things like on the left, hazelnut trees planted in with them. They've got some no-till right there in the center and then they've got garden boxes. So they're using a combination of all three of these. Now, Gordon, he has some physical limitations, but he loves to garden. And so what they've done is they repurposed these plastic containers that were for cattle feed and they've drilled holes in the bottom of them and filled them with good quality soil. But if you look, all of these are on wheels so that they can be easily moved even by somebody who's in a wheelchair. As time went on, they started out with little wheels, but then they progressed to larger wheels because they found out the larger wheels worked better. You can see behind Gordon there and his wife, there is plastic. And what they've done is they had this shop and they open up the garage door of the shop and they've put plastic there. So on the photo on the right, you can see I'm inside that building and I took that photo out looking at them on the outside. So they're growing things on the inside as well as the outside. When it's really cold, they just close that garage door and it protects that room from freezing. But during the daytime, they open it up. It's a south facing garage and they're able to grow a lot of food in there. I thought this was a really fantastic idea. This is Amanda. This is my um, beautiful daughter-in-law. And their yard last year was just grass. And they saw the writing on the wall and they just felt really strongly that they needed to be able to grow more food so that they could be self-reliant and take care of their family. And they removed the grass in the backyard and they put in all these small raised beds and they put wood chips for the paths. It was a lot of work initially, but look at what she's got there. This is a tiny part of the payoff, right? From the first year garden. This isn't a garden that's been in place for years. This is the first year and it has done really, really well. So we're really excited to see what happens this year because there's a learning curve and you always learn a lot, but wow, amazing, amazing thing that you can do. So, and that sod, it's actually really healthy. Like your lawn, if you want to um, till that up or turn it over and put stuff in there, you don't have to get rid of it because you've worked for years building that soil. Now, I love the Norfolk Botanical Gardens in Virginia. Wow, it is a beautiful place. And I have a few ideas that I picked up for, for you from there. So on the left here, that's a vertical um, garden bed. And it's it's created by using these posts, right? And then it's got the cross bars in there. But that black stuff that you see, it's just a high quality ground clover cloth. And they put the soil in there and then they they water it right in there. And they're growing all kinds of herbs and greens. And it was really fun to see this. But then over on the right, that is, I'm pretty sure it was a fig tree that they have. It's espalier or espalier or something like that. It's where you grow, you train and prune the tree to grow flat, like along a fence line. And this is just a really good example of that. And they've got a bunch of greens and things growing in the ground right there in front of it. But you can do all that. The tree doesn't have to be round. You can make those trees against a fence. You can make them so that they um, train them so that they're an arch and all kinds of beautiful things and still 
produce fruits that can feed and sustain your family. Another thing that they have there is a beautiful little cottage garden. And the center picture, you'll notice that they have really fun different ways to go vertical. That yellow um, trellis in the front, they grow like peas and green beans growing up. It, And then their tomatoes grow up all of those little towers. And they've got this cute scarecrow. And the garden is meant to be delightful when you go there. It, it's meant to be good for the soul and happy and beautiful and yet still highly productive. On the left, you can see they're taking advantage of those fence lines. They've had to do things like that little picket fence wasn't enough. So they had to put chicken wire. They have problems um, in this area with rabbits and things getting in. And so they've had to protect against that. Just a lot of really good ideas. Botanical gardens are great to visit and capture some of the, the ideas from. Now, this is a friend of ours, the Smiths, and they created this. There's a whole video on it in our World War III Victory Garden series, but they just had free pallets. And so they decided to take those pallets apart and create garden boxes out of them. And look how beautiful and amazing and highly productive this area is. Look and see what resources you have that are free that you might be able to use to create your own garden boxes. I know my my father-in-law, Paul, he was just a huge fan of the traditional garden and he did not appreciate um, raised beds. But I appreciate raised beds because I think they're so much easier and less work once they're, they're um, put into place. But you can choose whatever you want to do, whatever works best for you. This is my kitchen garden. I have two gardens, a production garden and a kitchen garden. This one is right outside my back door so that I can, with my bare feet, (laughs) come out my door and harvest whatever I need to make my dinner with. So I've got a lot of herbs in there and all that. But on the left-hand side, this is when it was first put in there. So it's about 10 years old now. And talking about free resources, there was this free white, it's kind of plasticish wood. I guess it was supposed to go around garage doors. It was a composite kind of thing. There was a whole bunch of it and we got it free from the contractor. And I was super excited because I didn't have funds to use anything else. So we made these, but if you notice, they have like crossbars across the top every four feet because these have a lot of bow in them, right? There's, they, they give and they would bow out. So they have it both underneath and on top to keep them straight. But these look as good today as they did the day that we installed them initially because of the kind of material it was made out of. But you can see in these next two pictures that we've done a lot with that garden. And it just produces better and better every single year. This is our no-till garden. But for those of you who know me, I have MS. And so um, my physical abilities are are declining. And I needed a little bit more help. Now, talking about permaculture, if you look, you can look around this garden and see that there are the, that's a hill. That hill used to be a lot taller because that's actually a hugel bed. What we did is we piled massive amounts of branches and logs and everything that we could as high as I could reach to put it on top. And then we had somebody come in and dig a three foot trench and put all that soil on top so that we have a swale going to help capture water. The hugel beds, the rounded hills are, are highly fertile. They do a really good job of growing things. But that's right here where this, this bed was. So what we've done is... We have taken and, well, actually John and Ben and the boys made these garden boxes for me because I just needed it for accessibility. Well, see on the left-hand side here, there's those goji berries, right? And that hill is really kind of hard to maintain. So it created extra work. You can see in the background, do you see all those apple trees along that border? They ripen consecutively from August till November, giving us fruit all along there. And we'll talk about that um, in just a little while. Notice those same goji berry bushes. What John did is he put a retaining wall here when he made the beds. And then we filled that in so that um, we could grow tomatoes all over there. So what it's done is a couple things. It's increased the amount of growing space that I had because I couldn't have done that before. And then it also makes it really clean because these pathways While I want the pathways to go ahead and grow stuff, since then I've actually planted some clover in there and we keep them mowed. 
but I want that life there and I want that um, coolness and the cleanness. So, but the retaining wall is seriously amazing. And all this is so much easier and less to maintain. There's a few things when we built these boxes that you should know about. One is that underneath there, we have hardware cloth because we have gophers and we wanted to make sure that that wasn't a problem inside the, of the garden box. Then we lined the bottom of the beds with thick layers of, of cardboard, like three, four, five layers thick, because we definitely have a problem with bindweed. And I know I'm going to have that problem everywhere else, but I can keep it out of my garden bed by making sure that I put this cardboard down and it will eventually break down. Then we filled these beds with twigs and wood chips, leaves, manure, any kind of organic matter. In fact, some of the food storage that was donated to us that I wasn't okay feeding the chickens too. I just dumped it in here. Anything organic is going to be okay. And then when we first, remember how beautiful that garden was to start with? Before we put these garden beds down, we took all that topsoil off and put it in a giant pile. And then we replaced it. Kind of if you look at the one in the back, you can see like there's eggshells and all kinds of stuff in there. Um, and this one in the front, you can see the round chicken manure or not chicken manure, um, rabbit manure. But then we put this garden soil on top of it so that as all that was breaking down underneath, the roots were in this beautiful garden soil. And then today, with this garden, it's gorgeous. It is, I can produce so much food in it. And it's really easy for me to take care of because of how tall it is. You look at these tomatoes and I'm just, you know, walking by and I can prune them just standing up. And it's just a very, very beautiful setup. I'm truly grateful to Jonathan for creating it for me. Let's talk about an edible windbreak. Wind is really hard on a garden, right? We need to protect it. And here where we live, we have some really fierce winds. And so I wanted to plant, plant edible things, right? So on this, these are goji berries. We have a friend who brought seeds home from Tibet and started them. And he gave me some starts, which I have all over my garden now. And there's a couple drawbacks. They do send up shoots, which we just cut and feed to the rabbits or the chickens because they love them. But both the leaves and the berries are edible. They're highly nutritious and all of the animals really, really like them. It provides privacy as well as that windbreak. Now, this is that apple tree hedge that you saw before. It ripens from August through November. And it's seriously, it adds so much beauty. And it's a windbreak and a, kind of a privacy screen. And all of that, the things that are planted underneath there are planted in guilds. So we have different nitrogen fixing things that feed the trees and we have comfrey. And, and there's a reason for all of it. But and we won't go over that here. But just think about that. Is there any place where you could put something along a property line, along your fence line, take advantage of grapevines and fruit trees to create a beautiful inviting backyard. My yard looks a little bit wild. I'm kind of the food forest type, but like in this backyard, he's got these grapevines growing over his little patio area and he's got fruit trees all over and bushes that bear fruit along the fence line. And it can be a very beautiful, inviting place. It doesn't have to look like a food forest. So whatever you like, just don't forget to do the edibles. Growing vertically can significantly improve your production. These are cucumbers, right, that are growing up and over. And then on the other side, there's tomatoes that are growing up and over. And it takes that little footprint of the garden and significantly expands it. Cattle panel arches have to be my favorite. In that first garden, let me go back there real quick. You can see that it's actually shading the garden bed. That was done intentionally so that I could grow like lettuce and the cooler weather crops so that they would have more shade and wouldn't bolt as quickly. But here I've got the cattle panels actually just shading the aisleway, which is beautiful, right? My pathway, it kind of creates this when it's in full um, production. It's like this um, enchanted little area. It's quite beautiful and it's just kind of magical. Now, the grapevines that you see here, these are cattle panels that are stretched over two chain link um, fences. We have a chicken run that's in here that we have some of our um, specialty birds in. So what this does is it provides summer shade for the chickens. And yet the chickens do a great job of helping to keep all of the critters, the insects down. But we're, we're just thinking how we can utilize space and make, make things more beautiful and make things more pleasant because the chickens are much happier underneath that shade than they ever would be in the hot sun. Foundational perennials. 
Perennials are plants that grow back year after year after year. You don't have to replant them every year. Some of the benefits of perennial plants is that they have a mature root system and they're more drought tolerant. They have high production because they don't have to work on putting down roots every year. They've already got them there so they can focus more on producing food for you. And they're just dependable. They just always come back. Fruit trees. I love my peaches. They're one of our favorite, but they're dependable and they always give high, well, most of the time they give high, high yield. Sometimes you have a year where like, ah, I didn't get any peaches or I didn't get any apricots. But as long as you have other trees, then it doesn't really matter. You know, you can skip a year and you'd be okay. Grapes. Grapes are just beautiful. They're a great thing to have and you can eat them fresh. You can dry them or you can make um, jelly or juice. Our grape juice is amazing. We love that. Berries. Now, berries kind of the same concept as with the apple trees. Plant varieties that ripen throughout the growing season. The first berry that ripens in our area is called a honey berry. And it's kind of a, looks sort of like an elongated blueberry. And it's a cross between um, kind of a raspberry flavor and a blueberry flavor. A little bit on the tart side, delicious. But then strawberries come on. And then these are black raspberries. Then they come on. And then we've got other berries too, like um, the raspberries. I'm also excited. We've got yellow raspberries and red raspberries. And if you just plant a variety, then once one finishes, you've got another one. So you have that continual harvest. You don't need to have 10 of each variety. You could have one or two. It's just a good idea to increase that growing season, right? Take advantage of it. Now let's talk about perennial herbs. What you're looking at right now is chives. And I am so excited in the springtime when the chive blossoms come because chive blossoms are delicious. They taste like chives, only a little bit milder. They're great in scrambled eggs. I have this poppy seed dressing that is so good. But the um, perennial herbs, the um, chives are what make it seriously amazing. The rest of the year, I can use chives or dried chives in the winter, but they're ne it's never as good as when I have the chive flowers. Now, perennial vegetables, there aren't a whole lot of them, but there are some. These happen to be sunchokes or Jerusalem artichokes. They grow back year after year and they require very little maintenance. They make, have you ever seen a Jerusalem artichoke? It's like um, a green plant with beautiful sunflowers all over it. So nobody would ever know, except for me, I would know that it was a Jerusalem artichoke, but most people would just think, oh, they've got sunflowers planted. But when you dig it up, this is what it looks like. And as long as you just leave one little piece, it'll all grow back the next year. So it's pretty amazing. It's a great survival food. I'd rather eat potatoes all the time than I would sunchoke, but because these taste like Jerusalem, well, it tastes like artichokes. If you put them in the oven and roast them, it tastes like artichoke hearts. I think they're delicious but I wouldn't eat as many of them as I could eat a potato. So I'd want more variety with these. All right, we're almost done guys, save seeds. That's one of the ways that you can make your garden sustainable. These are lettuce plants that have gone to seed intentionally so that I could collect the seeds and so that it would readily reseed my garden, right? A caution here though, you want non-hybrid open pollinated seeds. You wanna grow those vegetables because those are the ones that you can save seeds from. One year I bought a beautiful pumpkin and I thought, I'm going to save seeds from this. And I planted it the next year and I got gourds. So sometimes you'll get something inedible like a gourd. Most of the time, like with a tomato, you're going to get another tomato. It's just going to not be true to the parent. It's not going to taste the same. So I would recommend doing the open pollinated seeds. Now this, remember those um, lettuce plants? Well, this is all came from just allowing the wind to blow some of those seeds. So every spring I have lettuce plants popping up all over the place because I let them go to seed and just reseed themselves. Then what I do is I'll take my little shovel and I'll dig up my little start and I'll put it where I want it to. But the seeds that grow outside grow as soon as the weather is good enough to sustain it, which is much earlier than if I planted it myself. So this is an amazing thing to do. It's it's a little bit more messy for your garden, but there are lots of things that will reseed. Spinach will reseed, charred cilantro, plant cilantro once and forever. It'll just keep growing back as long as you let it go to seed. It is more important than ever to grow as much of your own food as you possibly can. Think outside the box. You may look at whatever your circumstance is and think there is no way that I can do this. There, yes, there probably is. If you have an apartment, do you have a window? 
A south-facing sunny window is best, but you can even grow herbs in an east-facing or a west-facing window. There are even some things you can grow in a north window, not as many, or you can just use some grow lights. You can change the bulbs in your regular lamp to be the right spectrum to help your plants grow. There's all kinds of things that, that you can do, but you have to be willing to research it a little bit and get out of the box because now more than ever, it's going to be important that we can grow our own food. Thank you. Thank you for staying with me. I know this is a really long video, but now for the question of the day, what foods are you growing? What are you going to do this year so that you can grow more food and be more self-reliant and so that any supply chain issues that we have don't affect you and the ones that you love. Comment below. And thanks for being part of the solution.